Good morning, church. Again, my name is Pastor Luke. It's good to be with you. And on your way in today, hopefully you were given one of those little blue uh, packets. If you don't have one, we'll get you one. I want everyone to have one. Um, They're out there at the door if you need to get them on the way out. Uh, But they're a little blue booklet, and it says Glen Haven Mission and Vision on it. And uh, this is just a helpful little guide for you, very self-explanatory. It's similar to something you might have seen if you've been a part of our new membership class in the past five years, but basically helps guide you and ask the right questions of understanding where you fit in our church. Because whether you know it or not, maybe you don't know it, and I'm happy I can tell you today that you're a part, if you're in this church, you're here for a reason, and God is calling you in to be a part of a team. And the Bible describes it as a body, and you have a role to play. Each and every one of you has an important role to play, and the church is not quite the church without you in it, without you playing your role. It's not just me, it's not just our elders, not just our deacons, not just our worship team, it's not just our greeters. You have an important role, and I'm hoping that today uh, you will have an opportunity to see your place in it. I think, so today, that being said, we're taking a step aside from Genesis just for today, because it's always important for the church, I think, to continue to look back and look forward. We have to always be looking back so we can examine not necessarily to try to fix things or like, oh, I wish I, you know, we can go to go back and say, oh, I, I'm so bad and be shameful, but to learn from it, to see how far really God has taken us, right? The best part of looking back when you're on a hike is to get the view, not really to go, oh, that's where I, you know, you can say that's where I fell or that's where I really messed up. That's fine. But to look back and go, wow, look how far I've come. Look how far God has taken us. And so I'm hoping that today that's what we get to do together as we look at the mission and vision is ask the question, how far we have come? You know, the last time I I preached this message, Philippians 3, which is the basis of our mission and vision as Glen Haven Church, March 12th, I think it was, 2020 is when I preached. And it was actually the last, we had a congregational meeting that day. It was a difficult congregational meeting where we as the elders brought this mission and vision. But not only that, but COVID shut us down the very next week. The very next week, we were online trying to figure it out. And of course, we went through that and it led to the outdoor service, which I think was a, a great thing that God did with the church and allowed us still to be together. It wasn't just all videotape, which everyone was on. But so we're, we're looking back, okay, that was the first time we kind of broke through this mission of vision. And the church is, is very different than it was then. It's very different. A lot has changed. Some of you, there's, there's only a handful of us that were probably in that room at that time that are still here today. And so it's important that we continue to relook at who are we? Because we forget quickly. We forget where we've come from. We forget our identity. We forget our mission We lose sight of it all the time. That's why in the Old Testament, you see God telling Moses, remember, remember, tell the people, tell the people, don't forget who brought us out of Egypt. Why are we here? And so I think it's always important, especially as we're about to end this uh, 2024 year and look to 2025, what are we doing? How are we doing? How am I a part of it? How are you a part of it? We need regular times for checkup, for celebration. It's good to celebrate and say, look how good God is, but also correction. We're always celebrating on one hand God's goodness and correcting on the other, right? We want to correct. We are a Reformation people. We're Presbyterian. We're rooted in the Reformation. And one of the great words of the Reformation is reformed and always reforming. We are always reforming. Always going back to the word. Always going back to the chief vision. And so I want to draw your attention today to the text, which is from Philippians chapter 3. And it is this passage that really, uh, when I came to this church five years ago, when I got together with the elders of the church, it was this text that drove everything. It was this text that began the conversation about why are we here as a New Testament vision. So will you stand for the reading of God's holy word this morning? From Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. 
The Apostle Paul says this, writing from prison, mind you. Writing from prison to the people of Philippi. But whatever gain I had, he just listed, I was the Pharisee, I was tribe of Benjamin, I had it all, PhD. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. And not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal also to you. Also, let us hold true to what we have obtained. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Any of that sound familiar to what we say every Sunday? But it might mean something different than you've been thinking. Again, as I said, the important part of why we are having this study is because we're reminded from Proverbs that without vision, without mission, the people perish. If we don't have a bright and shining star, we are swamped. We are lost in the doldrums. And Paul, I think, sets the target for us. He sets the target for us as to what the church is to aim for, what we are straining ahead for. And there are three things. It's we aim to know Jesus as the Christ. Amen? We aim to know Jesus as the Christ. What's the Christ? The Messiah, our Savior. Two, we aim to become like Jesus in his obedience. Did you know, look at this, what it says in verse... 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Many of us say, yes, when our statement is to know Christ, becoming like him. And many of us think, well, that's great. I would love to become like Jesus, right? I'd be more compassionate. I'd be more loving. I'd be a better neighbor. That's all true. But are you willing to know him in the sense of becoming like him in his sufferings? In his death? Are you willing to die to self? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he says, come and die. So we have it right in our mission statement. I want to know Christ becoming like him. I want to die like him. I want to suffer like he suffered. I want to be obedient like he was obedient. We just sang, whatever my God ordains is right. That's, Jesus said that in the garden when he held the cup. A cup of wrath he was about to undertake when he was, he, he, his, his human self did not want to go through that pain, but he said, not my will, but your will. That's what it means to come like Jesus. Have you become like that? We all have a cup. You must drink. Suffering you must undergo. Are you willing to take it for Christ, like Christ? Are you willing to die to self? That's a different thing entirely. So we aim to know Jesus as our Savior. We aim to become like Jesus in his obedience. And that's all of it, right? Teaching them everything I have commanded you. And we aim to give God the glory in all we do. And you can see that the three components here of Philippians chapter 3 are found in our mission statement in the three points. To know Christ, to become like him for the glory of God. For God's glory. And that's tied to what we understand as the chief end of man. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. 
And Paul says it here. And this is a very joyful book in the face of prison sentences and persecution and death. So what does Paul also tell us? So number one, we aim to know Christ. We want to know Christ. Well, what does it mean to know Christ? Well, knowing Christ is not simply knowing about Christ. Knowing Christ is not simply knowing Him. (laughs) What do you mean, Pastor Luke? Knowing Christ is believing in faith that He alone is the Messiah of God. There are many people, you might ask them and say, are you a Christian? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Of course, you can intellectually believe in Jesus. There are many atheistic historians who believe in Jesus. That Jesus was a real man who walked the earth and actually died on a cross. That's actually mainstream history. That's hard to deny based upon the historical archaeological evidence. But that is not what it means to believe on Jesus as your salvation. You can believe in Jesus from Nazareth, but do you believe in Jesus the Messiah who saves you? Not others, but saves you. Jesus said it clearly, John chapter 1. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus said in John 6, 29, The work of God is this, that you will believe in the one he has sent. Acts chapter 4, salvation is found in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We desire, our goal as a church, first and foremost, is to know our Savior intimately and personally in a relationship. Yes, it is a cliche when people say it's not about religion, it's about relationship, but it's true. You've heard it, but it's true. It's true. It's about relationship. It's about fellowship with the living God. We can know everything about Jesus and not know Jesus. We can know everything about what it means to be a Christian how to do church, how to play church, and not know Jesus personally. This is a scary thing. And this is something, this is why we're having this this message today and why we need to hear it again and again. Because even in our best attentions, we we can raise our Ebenezers, we can start out with a great mission and vision and then begin to what is called mission drift and drift away from the North Star. And begin to drift away from where we set our course. Because we as creatures of habit, as human beings who many of you will probably sit in similar places. Actually today it looks like you guys are kind of mixed up. It's good. But we're creatures of habit. And we get in habits. And we begin to go through the motions. And it's so easy for us to go through the motions of religiosity and forget that first love fire that brought us back. Jesus came to the church in Revelation, and he had a hard word for many of them that were now 30, 40-year-old churches. And he says, repent and go back to the things you did at the beginning. Remember that first love fire. You guys have gotten really good with doctrine, and he applauds them for that. But now you've forgotten your joy again. You've forgotten that love, that passion, that childlike passion, devotion. Do you remember the moment you first heard the gospel? And how it shook you to the core. You wanted to tell everybody. I hope you've had that moment. This is a, you know, it's like this is a really great hamburger. I've got to share it. Have you had that moment? You remember that moment? Have you, let's get back to that moment. Let's refresh ourselves in that moment. Because Jesus is, if, if, he, is, if he is beautiful to you, if he is the beautiful aroma of life, It is natural for us to go, he's so lovely. Isn't he lovely? And Isn't he lovely? I remember when I got saved at 16, I wanted my friends, my football buddies, to know how lovely Jesus was. (laughs) And I I remember crying for them as a 16-year-old boy in football camp, wanting them to know my Savior as I know him. And there are times like, Lord, bring me back to that moment. Bring me back to that fire that was handing out Bibles in my seminar class. Saying, let's, let's, have a, let's have a meeting at school here. 
because I so want others to know how sweet and beautiful, because why? I know him. If you know somebody lovely and wonderful, don't you want to introduce them to others? So to know Christ, as Paul says it here, is automatically implies getting to know him personally. As I said, it's the difference between believing in him as a person and believing on him as your righteousness before God. That's what the Apostle Paul says here in verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So I ask you, church, do you believe in Jesus? Sure, that's fine. But do you believe on Jesus as your salvation? Are you leaning on the everlasting arms with your every ounce? That's what it means to know Jesus. Jesus said it as clear as he could say it in Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Does that frighten you? Church, we need a dose this morning of the fear of God. You, you're not being real enough unless you've asked, is that me? Have I said, Lord, Lord, and not really known the Lord I'm talking to? Have I believed in a Jesus idea that is not the true Jesus? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. And what was the will of his Father? What did Jesus say in John 6? To believe the one he has sent. On that day, many will say to me, on what day? The day of judgment. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Workers, busy bees who never knew me. Because, right, didn't I do all these things? And there it is. That's the, here it is, the religion and relationship component. Many, many will say, did I not go to church? Did I not do the motions? Did I not tithe? Did I not volunteer at everything? And Jesus will say, who are, I'm sorry, who are you? I've never, I, you never talked to me. That's a scary church. Make this shake you this morning and tremble. Tremble before the Lord on this reality. You can be a Sunday school teacher and not go to heaven. You can be a preacher and not know Jesus. Because we are so used to the religiosity, the motions, the going through the flow. But Jesus says, yeah, you did a bunch of great stuff, but you never knew me. We had no relationship. You never called out to me as your Savior. Right? You released, but never received. You went right to releasing for whatever your own motivations. And let's be real. In our country, being a Christian has had a lot of perks up until recent times. It makes you feel good. Get involved. Community service, whatever it is, it's easy to do. But you never received and responded to me. Depart from me, you worker bee of unrighteous, of wickedness. This is not to say that prophecy, casting out demons, these works are not beautiful, but if you don't know him, what are they? They are dirty rags. We want to know Jesus personally. Heaven forbid that you be a member of Glenhaven Church that I preach to you and you get stuck in religion and not relationship. I want to be faithful to you, church, to say that the God of all creation, Jesus Christ, calls out to you to have a relationship with him through faith. 
Yes, he will do amazing things through you. He will bless this earth in amazing ways. But the number one goal for you is to receive and respond to your God in worship. There are many people who have come into this church and have said, Pastor Luke, where can I get involved? What can I do? And then the natural inclination, of course, is to say, oh, right this way. Especially in a small church. It's like we have a lot of things they need doing. And it's, I've made the mistake of putting some people just right into things because they said, where can I help? But never saying, here's the first thing you can do. Have you worshipped yet? The first thing I want from you is to come to worship and to receive and to know Jesus. You say, What's, what, what do you want from me as a person who comes in the Glenhaven Church? You just wanted me to do something? No, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to worship him. I want you to worship him not only here, but at home, in your prayer closets, in your families, after your family meals, on your drive home, amongst your friend groups. I want you to worship and know him. Then we can talk about things that need doing. But if you don't first receive and know and respond and renew and do that for a while, because also part of what we want to be here at Glen Haven is do less better. Dead and dying churches do too much poorly. They're not, if you've studied any dying church and you've studied uh, the, the, da- the data, they do too much. They do everything but the main thing. And that's growing and knowing Jesus Christ. Without that, everything is pointless and meaningless. And don't just hear it from me, church. Hear it from Jesus. Number two, we want to become like him in obedience to him. What is the obedience like him? Paul says it. Whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as This is a curse word in the Greek. Okay, we call it rubbish. Use your imagination. That's Paul. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards with all my might what is ahead. That is, to come to Glen Haven Church and therefore to be a Christian, the Apostle Paul says, we must let go of less and take hold of more. What did I tell you last week? How to trap a raccoon? Just make a little hole big enough for its fist to go in and try to get that sandwich. But once it grabs that sandwich, its hand is too big to go back out the hole. The only way that it can free itself is by letting go of the sandwich. You've got to let go so you can grab on. Amen? We have to let go of everything behind so we can grab hold of everything that is in front of us. This is death and imprisonment. Let go. And the Apostle Paul just got done saying, here was Paul, here was Saul, PhD, Pharisee, Benjamite, Jew among Jews, law keeper, letting it go and straining straining forward as Saul, slave of Christ, bought by Christ, righteousness in Christ and not through the law. To become a Christian for Paul is to have, and we talk about this all the time, a great reversal. The inversion. Jesus said it. To gain your life, you must lose your life. You must let go of self. You must die to self. Every day, Jesus says, you must pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. This is what it means to become like Jesus. Who gave it all up? He just said in Philippians chapter 2, becoming like a servant, right? Who humbled himself. Go back to Philippians 2 if you need to read it again. Who left glory and went down, down, down into our weary estate, into a feeding trough. And for the joy set before him endured the cross, says the writer of Hebrews. What was once gain is now lost. What was once rubbish to us and to the world's standards is now everything to us. Lose everything 
to gain everything. This is the gospel. The beautiful letdown. Freeing surrender. I was talking to a pastor during Presbytery who went through a debilitating disease where he was left paralyzed in a bed for weeks. He's now a preacher. Was in the corporate world. And he said he had never felt more free than when he was in that hospital bed. When he finally gave it all to Jesus. And we just go like, oh my goodness. But I've heard this story countless times. Of there is a beautiful surrender. A beautiful letdown. Because we, we, we're, we're, we're such that little raccoon holding on to our sandwich. We're just like, ah. But when we finally go, I'm in the Lord's hands. I could die today and it's okay. I'll be in glory. To, 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 the Apostle Paul goes on to say, if I die, it's gain. If I live, it's gain because I can still do ministry. But it's even better if I die because I'm with the Lord. And this is why he's sitting in a prison cell, a Roman prison cell, okay? Not fun. And he says, to the God of all comfort. And how is he able to do it? Because his, he has a surpassing treasure, a surpassing worth. The glory of God. He, he's kept his eyes on the prize. Who's his prize? All of God. Jesus being with him. And if Jesus is your supreme worth, church, we got to treasure our prize. If he is your supreme worth, everything else just falls apart. And there's a surrender in it. That even in our broken bodies, in our hospital beds, when you can't even blink for yourself, you can find freedom. I want you to have that and know that because we're crippled by anxiety. What if I'm in that bed? And we're going to end up in that bed. Somewhere, somehow, we'll be in that bed. What are you going to do? This is why this is the training ground. It's like, oh, yes, I will surrender it to my God. And there's a, a delightful grace. Otherwise, we're in struggle mode. We're on the struggle bus. The Apostle Paul tells us we are to have no other competing treasure with Christ. Competing treasures causes chaos. Competing treasures causes mission drift. For what is more important than this? What is more important than Jesus? Our highest treasure, therefore, when Jesus is fixing our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, when Jesus is in his rightful place, and that is high and lifted up, the name above all names. What did we sing that all the time? He's the name above all names. What does that mean? He's the worth above all worths. He's the category above all categories. He's at the top of the hierarchy, and everything else finds its place. And when Jesus is our highest treasure, all of our treasures become stewardship categories. Amen? Amen? They become, no longer are they treasures, my precious. They are just tools for his purposes. And that's freedom. And so we're told by the Apostle Paul now, because of this, to remember, repent, and renew. And all of you have been formed and refined. You've been all been given gifts, various personalities, pasts that have given you, you, you have messes, you have been, many of you have gone through a mess that has become your message. You're champions for something. In the church, it, we want champions in the church. Those who come forward, and, and what the church says is that, you know, many times in the church, people will come forward to me and they will say, Pastor Luke, I think we should do this thing. And I say, are you willing to lead it? No, I thought you were going to do that. <laughs> Be a champion. Say, God has given me this vision, this mission. Will you help me do it, Pastor Luke? Will you equip me to do it? That's where I say, oh yeah, for sure. That's my job, is to equip you as champions where you're gifted and called so the church can be the church. Right? It's not on our job to build a program for everything. Heaven forbid, right? That's where we die. But for you to be equipped in your calling, in your place, if it means a program that you want to champion and run, that's fine. But you're to be equipped to do it. 
This is the training ground, the equipping ground, the, the, the suiting up. This is the armory, the forge. And you've all been gifted and you've all been given a message of the gospel in different contexts in a different way. And, you know, when I, when I preached this mission and vision the last time, I, you know, I took you guys all through, for those that were there, like you've learned by now that I'm a huge Lord of the Rings geek. And I love Lord of the Rings. And there's that, that scene from the movies that's so well done where little Frodo, you know, he's the little hobbit. And he says, he'll take the powerful ring. He's going to take it all the way to the, the volcano and destroy it. And he says, but I can't do it alone. I don't, know, I don't know where I'm going. But I'll do it. I'll take it. And then one by one, you know, the man gets up and says, you have my sword. You have my bow and my axe, right? And that is the, that's a picture of the church. Our goal is the same. But I, like you need, we can all be Frodo's in our own world in the, own, the sense of the church, but I need your sword, your bow, your axe. It's a fellowship that makes this happen. Yes. And we suffer when you're not here. You have an instrument the Lord has equipped you with. You may not know what it is. That's okay. I'm not going to give you an assessment. I'm going to tell you to first receive and respond and get to know and worship and then start doing things and following as the Spirit leads and the Lord will reveal to you, oh, I have a sweet axe. And it's meant for chopping for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. And we need it. We're desperate for it. We need you. So finishing up, third... We want to know Jesus personally. We want to be obedient to Him, even to the point of saying, I surrender all. Take my all. My everything is yours. But all for His glory. Like, why why are we here? Yeah, we want to know Jesus. Yeah, but, but who gets the glory in all of it? Is the hope one day that our that we'll have our name up in lights? Right? No. It's not for Luke's glory. Heaven forbid. It's not for the Sessions' glory. It's not for Presbyterian glory and the Reformed tradition. It's not for Glenhaven glory that Glenhaven could become so multi site, sweet, cool story. No. Heaven forbid. It's not for any legacy we can come up with, any past glory. We live solely for the glory of God. And you know what that means for us? That means planting seeds today, knowing that you may never eat of the fruit or sit in the shade of the tree. Amen? Will you do that? Because that's what it means. That's what living for the glory of God means, is that it has nothing to do with me. It's not about me. We say, Glenhaven Church, where it's not about you, it's about Him. And as soon as we make it about us, it's over sauce, okay? It's donezo. It's about Him. I love this church. If you go out these doors, there's a cornerstone to this church. When it was established in 1957 by faithful saints. And you know what that verse is? There will be no idols before me. That's the verse. You have no idol before me. I love that. I love that that is the cornerstone verse of this church when it was established. May it be continued today. Amen. May it be true today that the glory goes solely to God alone. That he is high and lifted up. And therefore, I will give, I will, I will preach, I will do whatever I'm called to for him and for his glory. You must remember that. That when, when you worship, or when, you, when you make food for open table, you are providing a place where people can dive deeper into the word of God for his glory. Amen? Amen. When you help out in the nursery, you are providing a place so that other moms and other parents can sit here and hear the word so that they can go and live it out for his glory. Amen. When you get involved in these things, when you greet someone and you say hello to them, there are many people who said, I've started coming to this church because it was the first church that said, welcome and introduced themselves to me. You guys have been great at that, that acted not just friendly, but wanted to be friends with people. We got to get better and better. But you're doing that so you're providing a place where people can meet and see Jesus for his glory. It all matters. 
And that's why we have our mission, to know Christ, becoming like him for the glory of God. And how does Glen Haven, how? and so the vision of that, as we've put it, is how do we do that? How do we do that specifically? How is everything broken down? And you see that in your little pamphlet. You can see where all of our ministries align. And, I, and I've had to be ruthless with our session. And I hope you hold it to the same standards. Like, are we, are we doing this just to do it? Or is it because it responds to our mission and vision? And no, no person, no thing, no idol gets in front of the mission and vision that God has given us. And so to be, we, we, we recognize it as a corporate body We do these three things we just spoke about this morning by being a church to our community that preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. First and foremost, we are nothing without the gospel. The gospel is everything. Amen? We serve the needs of our neighbors. We are blessed to be a blessing. But ultimately, that we be empowered by the Spirit, empowering others through the Spirit, equipping them, giving them the tools. This is the forge, I said, to be a disciple who makes disciples that becomes a champion in in wherever God has called you. Our job, my job, is to equip you to champion the place God has called you. So I ask you this morning, will you strive ahead? Will we continue in this vision? Will we continue in the mission God has given us? Always we should be asking, are we doing that as a church? And then think about yourself. Am I doing that in some way? Am I doing that in some way? Will you finish strong in this? For whatever time God has for you, will you plant a seed today? And here's the reality, as I said about the glory of God, is this good, right? We're not, we have to get out of our mind the arrival. It's like, well, well, when, where, when does Glen Haven succeed? When does the church succeed? Is when every seat is filled and a new sanctuary is brought together and there's programs popping up? No, that'd be great, but no. That's not success. Success is what happens here. If this building blew up in a gas fire after we all left, Lord willing, the church would still go on. If, if, we, all, if, if we were killed by terrorists for some reason right now, nothing that you have done is in vain. Ministry still happened, church. Worship still took place this morning. The word of God was still preached. The saints were still edified, amen? Amen. It still matters. It matters today. So everything you do, there's no arrival. The arrival is Christ Jesus comes back and takes home his, 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 his myriads and myriads of saints, amen? But get out of your mind any other picture besides receive, respond, renew, release. Start with yourself. Be the change you want to see. And whatever God wants to do with you, let him do. So how does this change your church understanding? Your giving, your time management, forsaking everything so that others may gain Christ and be found in him. Is that what I'm doing? Have you found your place in this mission and vision? Again, as I said, my first place is go to the feet of Jesus. Start there. Don't be a busy bee. Start at the feet of Jesus. Grow. And then say, Lord, okay, what would you have me do? Where are places, where are their needs in this body? Where are they asking for volunteers? Is that the place that I have a passion? Let me try it. Where's a need that I see that isn't being met? Could I be the answer? And step out. And stick with it. Be consistent. And may we continue to follow after the Lord with all our might. And I end with this verse. My first time with our session in 2019, we prayed this together. And I pray it with you because it comes from Nehemiah, the great rebuilder. And he said this, and I told them these weary saints that were trying to rebuild Jerusalem after it had been destroyed by Babylon. I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Amen? Amen. Say, let's rise up and build. Let's rise up and build. Amen? Lord, strengthen our hands. Heavenly Father, as we come to your table.